Got it. We are in motion. Well, good afternoon now, everyone. I appreciate you being here. We have 157 people participating. My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I appreciate your spending some time with me today uh, to talk about vegetation response inside slash walls. This is a topic that's uh, something that, that I've worked on with my partner in crime, Brett Chedzoy. He and I have been working with this, you'll see, for about six or seven years now, maybe even a little bit longer. Brett's in Georgia visiting his uh, son, who's about to deploy, I want to say, to Germany. So he wanted to, uh, he's in the United States Army. So Brett's there. He would have joined us, but uh, I've gotten his go-ahead. So and other uh, colleagues that have participated in this, Paul Curtis, a professor of wildlife science, and David Weinstein, uh, forest carbon modeler. So I appreciate what they have to offer. Uh, feel free as we're going along to uh, type in questions into the chat window. I can see it. I've got it set up so that I can see the chat window. I probably won't spend too much time looking at it, but if you have a question, there's a timestamp, and then we can figure out, uh, we'll go through questions at the end and make sure that we cover all of those questions. Uh, this, So we are being recorded. This will be available within a few days on the Forest Connect YouTube channel. And I'll be giving this same presentation live this evening at 7 p.m. First, I want to make sure I acknowledge there's an enormous number of people that have been part of this overall effort, and you can see them listed here. Um, I especially want to that that lowest bullet there in the first cluster. There have been a lot of you all, foresters and loggers and landowners that have participated in our annual field tours that we've talked to on the phone, that we've communicated by email, and you've given us tremendous ideas. Uh, so you you just, I, I hope you keep doing that. Uh, we enjoy all of those conversations. And sometimes it's just a tiny little snippet that you have to offer from an observation or a perspective. And that launches us into a whole new line of thinking. So we appreciate that. The current, this has received a lot of funding from many different sponsors. The current primary sponsors of this are uh, New York State DEC and New York State Ag and Markets through the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry that hosts an institute called CAFRI. You'll see more about that later. Center for Applied Forest Research. Um, uh, Climate and Applied Forest Research Institute, I'm sorry. And we have a website slash wall dot info. So this, the story that I'm primarily going to talk about takes place at Cornell's are not teaching a research forest. We're pushing almost a hundred years of ownership by Cornell of at least the core part of the are not forest, almost 4,300 acres, almost all forested, as you can see in the topographic map in the lower right-hand corner. It's a working forest in that we have a relatively small area set aside for long-term research. That's, that is, that we don't deliberately disturb. All of the rest of it has the potential to be managed at some point in time now or in the future. A lot of northern hardwoods, which is sugar maple, beech, and yellow birch, and uh, some Allegheny hardwoods, which is northern hardwoods with some cherry mixed in, and then some mixed oak, which is some red oak, uh, heavy to red oak mixed in with some northern hardwoods in Allegheny hardwoods. Uh, pretty rugged terrain over most of what we're looking at. So we've done, we've had a history of forest harvesting going back many decades, and we started really paying attention to those in the 1990s. I took over as director in 2000. The regeneration cuts that happened that were initiated in the early 2000s didn't go as we had planned. So we had a we started an oak shelter wood seed cut in 2004. You can see that picture in the top 2019. 
and it's poised, depending upon what we do with the next entry, it's poised to make a conversion to striped maple and hop hornbeam and invasive shrubs and some other species that don't have quite the market potential that sugar maple and red oak and white oak and, and cherry have. And then uh, the year after that, we launched and did a 20, about 17 acre strip clear cut, three separate strips, totaling about 17 acres, 100 feet wide. And we had a successful forest type conversion from a mediocre oak stand to pin cherry, aspen, beech, and eastern hop hornbeam. You can see that picture in the bottom. So that was just, that was really disappointing. So these, these events, uh, these, these harvests in the early 2000s brought me to, and we had done what we thought was everything right. We did the cutting, we had, um, you know, good crews in there working on it. We monitored what was going on and we did some herbicide treatments, especially in that upper harvest there, the, the 2004 shelterwood. And, and it just wasn't working. I was convinced initially that this was a vegetation management problem and came to the uh, to a realization that's really all about deer. And so you all have seen deer. Here's a deer in one of our more recent research sites, a deer chewing on beech leaves, which means that that deer doesn't have anything better to chew on. So deer are selective browsers. They can do uh, pretty extensive, have pretty extensive impacts on forest vegetation. Many of you already know this. This was a project that Paul Curtis and I started in about 2009-ish up in the Western Adirondacks. And I was interested in doing some patch cuts in beach and beach control and seeing what grew back. And Paul was interested in what was happening with the deer and the deer impacts and what grew back. So I did some cutting and some herbicide treatments and Paul put up some fences. You can see the fence there on the right. It's fully occupied by yellow birch. Anybody be proud to have that level of stocking of yellow birch coming in within a few years after harvest where seedlings were not protected. It came into uh, to fern. So most of the other sites, most of the other sites, so that we had a dozen of these locations and most of them looked something similar to this. So we were trying to figure out what to do with the Arnott Forest. We had stopped uh, regeneration harvest because we were not interested in leaving a legacy of beech and striped maple and hop hornbeam. And we were exploring what was working elsewhere. We knew that, so we knew that here fences work, right, on a small scale, but we're working at a bigger scale than that. So we looked to Pennsylvania that's had a long history of really good research and, and inquiry into how to manage impacts of deer. And, and for them, fences work. And so we started considering the use of fences. And as we as we looked at the details of it, it was the expensive, very expensive to put up, but the real expense is not the installation, it's the maintenance. And so you have uh, eight to 10, let's say eight to 10 years of very regular observation and maintenance that has to happen. And that initial, um, the initial harvest that we were thinking about putting in in 2016, where we would be using uh, a fence was about 6,000 feet of perimeter. It was not accessible by an ATV. And it was, it was, um, it was not something that we had the staffing capacity to be able to manage. So we had to come up with some other option. So we, we thought about slash walls and we talked about it and we talked to a lot of foresters and a lot of loggers and we wondered if that might be a solution to allow us to continue with regeneration harvesting. We had stands that were to the point that we needed to regenerate them. We were trying to balance age structure across the Arnott Forest. It was a largely aging, uh, mature forest, that 4,300 acres. We wanted to be able to demonstrate successful forest regeneration. This is um, 
you know, this is as a, as a demonstration and teaching forest, we know that other, other landowners are practicing forestry. We want to be able to demonstrate for telling people to do it correctly. We need to be able to demonstrate that through the, through the balancing of age structures, we knew we would have a more diversified habitat. And there was a growing interest from Cornell in being carbon neutral and being able to sequester more carbon. So we were looking, we were trying to find something that would work. Uh, there were a lot of lots of discussions with the State Wildlife Agency about policy changes and trying to impact the deer herd, changing things like uh, hunting seasons and um, just in the policy arena, those changes happen relatively slowly and we needed to be able to act relatively quickly. We also needed to be able to reverse the legacy impacts of deer because the, that, that preferential browsing by deer, while it removed the desirable species, uh, which tend to be the higher value species, coincidentally, it left behind the lesser value species that that created uh, a light barrier, a shade barrier to subsequent regeneration of these forests. So we needed to deal with that. We didn't have a big budget for, for herbicide treatments and certainly not for installing fencing and virtually no budget and staff in order to do inspection and maintenance. So in 2017, we started slash walls. Now, these are not pictures of the 2017 slash walls. I'll show you that in just a minute. But this is an aerial view that's looking down and, and showing you at the bottom edge of the corner, that's about a six acre harvest with a slash wall in the middle. You see about a 24 acre. And then at the far end towards the top of that picture, it's about a 140 acre slash wall. And there's three one acre circular um, experimental uh, slash walls in the center. So we started in 2017. We started with a 74 acre harvest. And the first, the first question, aside from the vegetative response, aside from silviculture and all the other things that we're talking about was, can we exclude deer? So this was, uh, th these are the results that we obtained from a protocol that we had developed independently of the slash wall project, but Paul Curtis and Christy Sullivan and I and Gary Goff and others uh, in partnership with New York State DEC developed AVID, so assessing the vegetation impacts of deer. And the, the quick explanation of AVID is that you tag seedlings and then you measure their height. And every year you go back and measure the height of those seedlings. So it's statistically very robust as what's called a repeated measures design. And you can see here that red oak inside the slash walls had a pretty decent growth rate. They were growing somewhere on the order of eight to 10 inches per year inside the slash wall, not so good outside the slash wall. In fact, the red oak heights inside the slash wall were two times taller than the red oak seedlings outside the slash wall. So this, these were data collected from the first slash wall. The protocol has you wait one full or actually two growing seasons. So this would have been 2018. We had established these tagged seedlings or tagged these seedlings two years after getting started. And by year two, these seedlings were already about 10 inches tall. Looking at sugar maple, the, the, uh, the impacts of uh, the benefits of being inside the slash wall are even greater. Sugar maple seedlings are about three times taller inside the slash wall than outside the slash wall. So we took this and some other evidence. We had uh, motion sensitive cameras that Mike Ashdown has maintained so we could keep track of deer movements. If we had deer inside, we were looking for that. We initially had some bait stations inside the slash wall. Those didn't there were no deer inside the slash wall, so they didn't um, get, they were, it was just a lot of effort for no reward. We did tracking in snow and in mud to make sure that we could in fact validate that slash walls exclude deer. When in the conclusion from that, and that's not what I'm focusing on here today, but the conclusion from that was that slash walls when built correctly do exclude deer. Now it's possible to not build them correctly 
and have a lot of headaches with deer. The one learning feature, and Paul Curtis had advised us of this early on, is that deer will happily tunnel underneath the slash wall. So when we look at the process that for building the slash wall, why that's important, or the, how to do that, that's important because it, it's a good way to exclude deer from coming underneath the slash wall. So the conclusion, good slash walls, correctly built, exclude deer. In terms of the design, I'll just show a couple of, uh, talk through a few points with this. The shape and the scale and the size matter. This is the first slash wall that we put in a drone picture of what we call the gas line harvest. You can see running through the center of that picture, a linear corridor that's a now retired natural gas pipeline. So these things matter for effectiveness. Uh, you want effectiveness, you need it to be sufficiently tall. And I'll, we'll talk about the specifications here in a minute, sufficiently wide. And, and a key thing is sufficiently dense. The slash walls, these are large structures. They end up being 20 feet wide. I'll just tell you 20 feet wide, 10 feet tall, and dense enough that you really can't see through them. If you can see through them, it's probably not dense enough. Certainly at the base, if you can see through them, deer have nothing better to do than wander around and see what kind of uh, trouble they can get into. These attributes of shape and size uh, influence the cost, uh, cost per foot in terms of the material, and then the cost per acre in terms of the perimeter relative to the area. The way they're built, all of ours have been built uh, on our property by a single logging crew. They've used a couple of different feller bunchers, and this is just a picture of a feller buncher in action. They are not moving. If our crew does not move slash around the site, they take most of the slash from within about 100 feet of the perimeter. Usually on the interior of the harvest, though, we've given them the option to work from the outside as well. And and it's an all-in mentality. So it's the, the wood that's near the edge, and this is still, it's the landowner's wood, and it's and you set up the sale to make sure that that, that that volume proximate to the wall is dedicated to building the wall. Um, a, a wall that's 99.8% effective is a failure of a wall, and the deer will find that two percentage of a, of a gap. So here they are building the wall. And then that same machine was used to do what we call brush the understory. So the essentially all stems greater than six feet tall were cut. And this was that part of removing that legacy of vegetation that would otherwise interfere with the, with the regrowth, the establishment and regrowth of desired seedlings. Here's one of our newest walls, what we call the Caffrey walls from the outside. It's starting to show the, the attributes that we think are important for building the walls. You need a relatively solid base. By base, I mean for four or five feet. And this is scrag wood. It's maybe not the classic definition of slash, but it's anything that's low grade. Uh, we're not talking about putting veneer quality or, or prime logs in there, but but if there's anything that's not worth very much, it should really be dedicated from that outer buffer, um, dedicated to building the wall, and then coarse, fluffy material goes on top. So we recommend 10 feet tall. Based on our earlier efforts, we now say 10 feet tall to a two inch diameter stem, and that works out to be about 20 feet wide, and it needs to be sufficiently dense especially when you're down at deer level that you can't easily see through it. We took a, a trick from a consulting forester here in New York, Kellen Murphy, who puts a mark on the trees and that creates a target. You can see that orange mark here on that red oak tree next to the slash wall. Uh, that creates a, a target for the loggers so that they don't have to guess where 10 feet is. That's the, that are the, the, that's the visual guide. This is looking at a passageway that we cut through these newer slash walls. Uh, and I'll talk about why we did that later on, but it shows nicely the, 
the distribution of material. So this is this wall is about 20 feet wide, and I think this is a 10 foot wall. So the, the pictures often don't portray the size and the magnitude of these. Most of those logs below the center are 10 to 12 inches in diameter. Uh, and then above that, you have much, you know, they're smaller, they get down to twos and, and threes and fives and what have you. But you get the idea, large diameter material creates a base, smaller diameter material on top. The cost of this, and these are pre-inflation dollars, I want to emphasize that, the cost per foot we we had used for all of the ones walls we had built thus far was about $1.50 a foot. And depending upon the acreage, that can be as high as 300 or more dollars per acre. And on larger harvests, it may be down to $150 per acre. And again, the moral to the story, if you take one thing away, if you're thinking about building a slash wall, if you're harvesting the loggers cutting near the perimeter, the, the mentality has to be an all in. And that's not truly all in keep your veneer logs, keep your high, very high value logs, but anything that uh, is, is less than that lower end on the spectrum, the priority has to be to build a good high quality wall. There's, there's no point in building a wall unless it's going to be good. It's, otherwise, all of the other effort has been wasted. So now the question is, do they work and how do they work? So we've talked about whether or not deer um, are excluded by slash walls. And the answer to that is yes, uh, if they're correctly built. The next is what can be expected from a slash wall in terms of longevity? How long do they last? When we built these, to our knowledge, they had not been built. We were the first ones to work with it. We didn't have any understanding about what we might expect for longevity. And if you keep deer out, what happens with the vegetation on the inside? We were interested in things such as the density and stocking of desirable step species, the heights of seedlings. One of our big interests was whether or not if we excluded deer and the selective browsing pressure of deer, and we leveled the playing field inside the slash walls by brushing the understory, if the regrowth of beech was going to exceed the regrowth of desired species. So we did some seedling height measurements different from the avid measurements. And then finally, we've, we've teamed up with David Weinstein, who's been doing work on modeling some carbon, and I'll show you some of his, uh, some of his results. First thing is looking at the variation in the construction of these walls. So these were the first walls that were built. They include the, there were four walls in 2017. Those are on the screen as the boot, red pine, wedge, and gas line. Uh, and then we had a couple that were more recent in 2019 was Decker and Recknagel was finished up in 2019. So the point here is you can see the the two, the boot and the wedge, both got above 10 feet. The gas line actually did get above 10 feet. I'm not sure why that is showing something less than that. Decker was an unusual situation. This was, we were, we were thinning it. So it wasn't technically a regeneration harvest when we would be prescribing a slash wall. We wanted to see what would happen and, and if we could remove enough material from a thinning, so a relatively low intensity harvest to build a slash wall? The answer is no. So we left 80 square feet of residual basilary and decker. These other walls, gas line had 11 square feet of residual basilaria throughout the harvest. Um, wedge, the wedge harvest had about 35 residual square feet. Recknagel had 50 square feet residual. But Recknagel had been thinned previously, so there was less material to work with. So it's all—it's always a, um, you know, kind of a, of a. There's an effort and a and a finesse that goes into building the walls. Um, where you position those walls will influence how well you're able to, to build those.
So we originally estimated the volume, and this was through a kind of a, rem I'll say remote, because we had a, a technician standing there trying to estimate the amount of wood that was being aggregated into the slash wall. So it was a visual estimation of 30 tons total per 100 linear feet of slash wall. And if we separated out just the stems that were six inches and larger, then we're looking at about 20 tons per 100 feet. We cut the passages as I, that I showed you earlier that showed you the freshly cut ends of the of the slash wall material uh, because we're working with uh, Shuntao uh, Chu, a professor here at Cornell and his graduate students to, who are using LIDAR to revise those estimates. So that will be the manuscript drafted. I'm not going to share any of that information, um, but it, it's, it's um, close, not quite as great as what we initially had estimated. So, but we're in the same ballpark. How long do slash walls last? So we went out and at fixed locations, annually measured the height and the width of the slash wall. Uh, this is the, just to illustrate the pattern, this is the, the slumping of slash wall heights in the gas line from 2017 through 2022. And there is a very consistent slump rate of, I'll say, 10% of the height per year. So when you look at the slope of that line, it's a 10% downward slope, slightly greater slump between year one and year two, and maybe a diminishing, but it's a, it's a pretty steady decline over time. And this was across all of the slash walls. So there wasn't, irrespective of this, of the material that went into it, it's a 10% slump. So that works out to be 10 or 12 inches of slump per year. By 2022, we were down to an average wall height of about five feet. That's why the width is important because a five foot wall, obviously a deer can jump it, but it, but it's still, and they went from about, they initially started at being about 21 feet down to maybe 19 feet or 18 feet. That's still pretty wide. Deer are not going to walk through something that wide when there's still coarse material in there because they're afraid that they're going to break their leg. It's the, if you've been out West and you've seen the cattle guards out West, it's the same uh, mentality as that. So that, that's all I wanted to share in terms of the responses of the actual wall. Now let's look at the vegetative responses. We put in sample points at the rate of one per acre. We took measurements that were related to the site variables, stem counts by species and height class, and then actual seedling heights. We did annual remeasurements of the site variables and the stem counts. We did not remeasure the same seedlings when we were doing seedling heights. And we categorized these as control and protected or browsed and unbroused or inside and outside. So the the when I say control, um, those are the, the plots or the sample points that are outside the slash wall. There were a lot of species. You can see most of them listed here. And for a, a presentation like this, it would be kind of mind numbing to pull out individual species. So I clustered them by what I call type. So we have commercial species. These are species that we can sell. We have diversity species. So those are species that we maybe can't sell. Some of you could sell in some of your areas, paper birch and aspen and sassafras. Uh, most of the time we can't sell that here, but they contribute to the diversity of the site. Um, but they're not what we would consider interfering, which are species such as beech and Australia, pin cherry, striped maple. We have a little bit of autumn olive. We have the other category. And then I pulled out sweet birch because sweet birch is just, it's relatively abundant throughout. Um, and it, and it, when it's included, you know, some people don't like it as a commercial species as you get further to the east uh, into the um, southern New England. Apparently, it's pretty valuable over there in parts of western New York. And you go west from here. It, it maybe doesn't have as much value. So I just wanted to separate that out as its own. 
So I'll, I'll do big picture. Um, let me back up here. So the note at the bottom here, the data, data when I'm talking most of the time, other than the next slide, I think, um, most of the time I'm going to be restricting my comments to stems that are at least four and a half feet tall and are exposed. So these are stems that had clear, uh, clear canopy overhead, so no canopy overhead, and were at least four and a half feet tall. So these are all of which just was the break point of our, of our, of our height thresholds. So these are stems that presumably have some um, prospect of growing into it for surviving, uh, as opposed to the stems that might be overtopped. That said, all stems combined, irrespective of height, irrespective of whether they were exposed or um, shaded, we see that there is 56% uh, uh, greater density of stems inside the slash walls after three to four growing seasons than outside. So inside, we're looking at about 18,000 stems per acre. Outside, we're looking at about 11,000 stems per acre. The picture that you see is from the red pine harvest. So this was almost a clear cut. It was, rem it was a overstory removal. There were a few scattered hardwoods that had established at the same time as the uh, when the red pine was was establishing. So that's a high density uh, seedling stand. A couple of caveats and things that we learned. Um, slash walls are not uh, are not an opportunity to turn your brain off. So you still have to pay attention to stand history, to the silvics of the species and the silviculture, all these matter. Some of the things that we learned is that you can release a seed bank and what, what you see in the picture is a, is a really lush stand of pin cherry that came into the wedge harvest, uh, a site that had never been harvested previously. So it had accumulated pin cherry seeds. We had always had a few pin cherries show up when we were doing harvesting, but deer provide enough browse pressure on pin cherry that it doesn't become a problem like it did here inside the slash wall. So most of the other slash wall sites had had some prior harvesting that had allowed for a release of the seed and then the deer nipped it back before it redeveloped uh, before those before those pin cherry developed into a seed producing plant. Another species that we have problem with was red elderberry. So just be attentive to those things. Another point that I want to make is that there's enormous variability variability between the sites that we're looking at. So I'm going to be showing you averages for all of these sites. This is just to show you, and this is looking at the stem density of desired species. So these would be the commercial species after three growing seasons. And you can see there's variability both in the average number, but also variability in the variability. So some of them are very are highly variable and others not so highly variable. Uh, it's just so that I don't want you to walk away saying, here's the average. This is what we can expect. Okay, looking at the abundance of exposed commercial and diversity species uh, inside the slash wall. So the gray picture is inside the slash wall. Outside the slash wall is the reddish or the rust colored picture. Sweet birch is not included in this. And you can see that there is a much higher density of these what we'll call desired species inside the slash wall than outside. The rate that these desired species are growing into that size class, so into that greater than four and a half foot height, is happening at the rate of about 750 stems per acre per year outside the slash wall, as compared to about 300 stems per acre per year. Um, I'm sorry, 750 inside the slash wall, 300 stems per acre per year outside the slash wall. So about double the rate of, of accumulation of these 
stems into that threshold category. Now, at some point, that's going to slow down as the canopy starts to close. But right now, there's very good recruitment of these desired species. Note that this includes harvests that are of different ages. So we have four harvests that are that we're, where we have six years of data. We have other harvests where we have four or five or three years of data. So we're not able to, um, we're, the, they're, again, we're averaging across all of these. We also have more species inside these slash walls. So we, we have a, at least 40 different tree species that are uh, stems greater than four and a half feet tall inside the slash walls, which is double what we see outside the slash walls. The drop-off that you see inside the slash wall, so the gray on the right-hand side between year three and year four, is probably a, the, the effect of having um, uh, higher numbers of, of data for three-year three -year data points as opposed to four-year, five-year, and six-year. So that those data points are going to shift across as they as they age in, if you will. I'll note that in the, especially in those early slash walls, we did not maintain uh, equal areas of control as we did. So outside the slash walls, we did inside the slash walls. So there could be a species area curve relationship that we're seeing here. But the patterns that Mike Ashdown, who's been the primary technician on this, um, feels like this pattern is pretty representative of what exists on the ground. Um, we have very good fortune to have access to Robert Wesley. Robert is a botanist with the Cornell Natural Areas, and he has gone out and poked around inside some of the slash walls, and it provided for us a list of, of herbaceous species that are the categorization would be not commonly seen. So these are not, we're not saying they're rare. We're not saying anything about their taxonomic status. Uh, just that Robert, in Robert's experience, and he's been doing this for a very long time, these are uncommon to find in areas where there's exposure to deer. And he enjoys being able to go into the slash walls and look for some of these and actually collect some seeds and try to get some established. I was also interested in knowing whether or not we had good coverage of our desired species. So I calculated an index of just what I call occupancy or percent occupancy. So within any one of these slash walls, what percentage of the sample points included stems that were desirable of, of the types, so commercial versus interfering, uh, that were exposed and greater than four and a half feet tall. Commercial species occurred on 55% of the points inside the slash wall and 25% of the points outside the slash walls. Interfering species had higher occurrence inside the slash wall than outside the slash wall, which was a little surprising. Sweet birch has greater occupancy outside the slash walls than inside the slash walls. So this is a picture inside the Recknagel harvest which is one of our, our flagship sites. It, uh, we, we coincidentally harvested this uh, right after a bumper acorn crop. So the acorn crop in the fall of 2019 was followed by a harvest and we had really good catch of the acorns and really good uh, germination. Um, and we've actually now just uh, last week, put this out for, uh, sold this as an overstory removal. There's a little plant in the inside here, the flowering plant. I just want to call attention. I'm not, we have not had the resources or the skill set on staff to do an, an aggressive herbaceous monitoring. But in these early successional woods that are protected from deer, uh, my understanding is there's a pretty good um, coverage and availability of, of species that would be of interest to pollinators. We do have colleagues who are working with pollinators, but the study is ongoing. So how do the seedlings 
grow in response. So again, these are not these were not randomly selected seedlings and they were not repeated measured seedlings. These are seedlings located at each sample point, usually within a six foot radius of the sample point, or if need be a slightly larger. The goal was to measure several hundred of these seedlings every year and keep track of just the height. And, and the intent was to know what's the height of beech, what are, which beech are winning, and which of the other species are winning. So we were looking for essentially measuring the winners, not trying to calculate an average height of seedlings. This is the gas line site. So this is a northern hardwoods, kind of a cool, moist site, uh, largely dominated by sugar maple, what you can see in the browsed areas outside the gas line wall is that the, the seedling heights there after six growing seasons were dominated by American beech and eastern hop hornbeam. Red oak was kind of keeping up and sugar maple was not doing very well at all. Uh, in the unbrowsed or inside the slash wall, we can see that eastern hop I'm sorry, if I said Eastern Hemlock, I apologize. EH is Eastern Hop Hornbeam. We can see the Eastern Hop Hornbeam is winning inside the slash wall, but that beech and red oak and sugar maple are all growing about equally and probably not statistically differently. Uh, the Hop Hornbeam is a bit of a surprise to us. We knew it sprouted. Uh, we What I don't have here, what I'm not portraying and I haven't yet teased out, is the stem density and the occupancy of, of how much hop hornbeam there is. So it's growing well, but this doesn't tell us how abundant it is inside the slash walls. This is the Recknagel, South Recknagel site. So this is a red oak dominated site outside the slash wall where it's browsed. We can see uh, beech and hemlock. So beech is doing about the same inside as outside. Eastern I keep saying hemlock, don't I? I'm sorry. Eastern hop hornbeam is inhibited by browsing, so it would appear. Red oak and sugar maple are very prominently inhibited. Inside the slash wall, beech and red oak are doing about the same, half the height of the eastern hop hornbeam. Some of that with the oak may be that those, the eastern hop hornbeam are probably stump sprouts and the red oak tend to be more seed origin. So the conclusion here is that we had uh, that, that by excluding the deer, brushing the understory, we're at least staying on par with American beech, which is the more common species that we see in most of these stands. We're going to be giving more attention now to eastern hop hornbeam to see what we need to do to help limit its, if it's, if it's taking over, how, what we need to do to limit that. So we're talking about how these um, stands recover and how they grow. That growth, obviously, when you grow wood, you're sequestering carbon. If you re review your equation for photosynthesis, David Weinstein has modeled the growth of plants at all of these sites individually. I'm showing you the gas line projections of carbon sequestration from 2023, which was the most recent data that he had looking forward for 100 years. And you can see that within 10 years, the outside data, uh, the green line diverges from the inside or the red line. And inside the slash wall, there's a uh, higher level of carbon sequestration than there is outside. I put in a, a a faint blue line at, at the year 2073 and calculated the difference, or David actually did, calculated the difference between inside and outside. At year 50, there's 40% more carbon sequestered inside the slash walls than outside the slash walls. So David's going to be working with these across all these different sites, and we'll be looking to publish this at some point, hopefully in the not too different distant future. So the conclusions with this are, as I said earlier, slash walls exclude deer. If you build them correctly, slash walls will exclude deer. Slash walls are also, in our experience, less expensive than fences, 
especially when you think about compared to an installation cost, compared to a maintenance cost, and compared to removal. So we don't know, we don't have a current estimate on installation pricing. Uh, it's at least, so we paid at $1.50. Uh, if you doubled it, that would be $3 a foot. Uh, it'll depend upon the equipment. All of our estimates are based on machine operator hours and the the knowledge when we've done time motion studies and the loggers collected data on that they were building walls at the rate of two feet per minute so you can calculate to use that two feet per minute calculate the perimeter and then work that against the cost per hour for the machine and the operator we, other than doing an initial inspection and walkabout there, we never have visited. Well, I, should, I take that back. We typically do not make any visits. We had we had one of our slash walls, the Camp Ridge slash wall, where we saw some evidence of deer. So we did have some uh, technicians go out and check for breaches. And then when that happens, then they plug it using putting some plastic mesh fencing across those breaches but very low maintenance and observation compared to those of you who have experience maintaining fences and there's no removal cost. So the, the slash walls will eventually rot and decay. The walls that we built initially were 10 feet tall total. And we were getting, we got a pretty solid five years out of those. So with our revised standards to a height, 10 feet to a two inch diameter branch, we're estimating we're gonna have better than six years of effectiveness. Seedling heights inside the walls are faster growing uh, than outside. We have not used any herbicides. So if you wanted to further kind of enhance the advantage that you have of these, you could, you could try to do some kind of stem selective treatments. We are going to do some, um, treatments. We have some areas where we have dominance by early successional species, and we want to see, uh, these are in walls that we expect pretty good longevity of, but we want to just experimentally see, are there ways that we can limit the what, what might be a, a six or eight foot tall canopy of native but non-desired species when we have desired species coming in in the 8, 10, 12, 20 inch height class. We feel that uh, moderate acreages are feasible for the development of slash walls. It depends a lot on how much prior management there's been. If you've been in there or somebody's been in firewood cutting or thinning over the years, the material that you've taken out uh, is no longer available to be used for building slash walls. Cost sharing is available. In New York, it's available through the New York State DEC, through the Regenerate New York program, and through the NRCS EQIP program. NRCS, as I understand it, is also funded slash walls in Rhode Island, and I believe in New Hampshire, and is uh, accessible to do that in Pennsylvania and maybe some other states. So there in the bot list at the bottom is just a, an accumulation of the summary points that I made from the earlier slides. So some of you out there are foresters or your landowners are going to hire a forester. What are the things that you should be thinking about? First, and this is a long-term vision, uh, pre-plan and uncut buffer for future slash walls. So if you're working in an area, especially if you have a, an ownership that has longevity, plan for some of a plan for a hundred foot buffer around the perimeter of a future regeneration harvest so that you have plenty of material to work with. If you can, and I'm not sure I can give you good advice on this, but Ideally, establish some desired advanced desired species, advanced regeneration of desired species. If you can have that established, even if it has some browsing on it, then when you exclude the deer, those stems are going to have a great advantage to, uh, to their growth and development. Um, where you do have the option to go in and do some thinning in advance, although not thinning in the buffer, 
uh, that thinning will hopefully be sufficiently intense that you can stimulate growth uh, or, or germination of seeds from the seed bank like pin cherry and probably the red elderberry. Both of those are seemingly browsed by deer because we don't see them except inside slash walls. You germinate the seed bank and then allow the deer to knock them back. The canopy closes and then at some point in the future, when you do a regeneration harvest inside a slash wall, they're not as problematic. When you're when you're designing the layout, position the perimeter of the of the harvest in an area where, if you can, in an area where there's abundant low grade material. Make sure that you work with a logging crew that's invested in the outcome. There are a lot of logging crews that we've interacted with that are excited about this. They've seen the impacts that deer have. They work hard to do a good job in the forest, and they're frustrated when they come back and they see that everything that, you know, that all that's coming back in is beech and hop hornbeam. Build good walls, and that's like 100% good walls, and I can't stress that enough. The walls have to be good or don't bother trying, uh, and you should get it something on the order of six years out of them. You may have to control some interfering vegetation. Initially, verify that the walls are effective. If you need to, plug them with some debris or plug them with plastic fence. We use really simple gate systems, and we've got a, 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 a user's guide that illustrates those that allow us to go in and out and allow hunters to go in and out pretty easily without uh, needing to buckle and unbuckle straps and latches and, and things like that. This has been a successful um, endeavor uh, based on its adoption. So we're aware of the list on the right, uh, the number of slash walls that have been created in other states. And the interesting thing, one of our concerns was we had only worked this far with one crew building slash walls, whether, I mean, this was, I mean, it's a good crew, but we didn't, we didn't think there's anything special about their equipment configuration, but we didn't know if it was going to happen elsewhere. So this is proof that it can happen elsewhere. All of these other locations had different logging contractor equipment configurations. And my perspective on this is that prescribe the outcome. And when you prescribe that outcome, the loggers, they're an industrious, capable bunch. If they know what the target is, they'll deliver the target to you. But I mean, they have to be bought into it to, to know what you want. Just to reiterate, we've enjoyed a lot of collaborative learning and support and sharing. This is, so this previous slash wall, this was um, one that was built in the Quabbin Reservoir in Massachusetts. Fabulous wall um, uh, and, and very, uh, they had a lot of material to work with by the, by the way they designed this harvest. That wall is going to last a long time. That's fully a 10-foot wall. It just it doesn't look like it, but that's absolutely 10 feet. This was a wall that Andy Hubbard put in, in, I don't recall if it was Connecticut or Massachusetts, uh, in, on some water company land, very nicely done. Uh, Andy and some others, uh, Hermack, and, and there's a lot of folks out of Southern New England have been very cooperative in sharing their experiences. Got there, Dan says, Canton, Connecticut. More recently, these were completed between September of 2021 and March of 2022. These are what we call the CAFRI slash walls. CAFRI is a Climate and Applied Forest Research Institute. That's an institute based at SUNY ESF, where SUNY ESF and uh, our college, College of Ag and Life Sciences, cooperate and work on things, research, forest research projects related to climate and applied forestry outcomes. So these are walls where we're experimenting with two acre versus four acre walls. And we've randomly assigned them to have an either seven foot or 10 foot height and a residual that's either a seed tree or a shelter wood and either with or without um, brushing of the beach. So those are the kind of the manipulations that we're, we're currently focused on. If you look 
towards the lower end of this picture, and there's some other areas that I'm not going to try to tease out, but we've also used brush walls around uh, formerly abandoned agricultural fields and planted seedlings. So a brush wall is a lesser version. And I'm not being judgmental. I am being judgmental. I'm not being critical. Uh, well, you get the idea. So a brush wall isn't as big and robust as a slash wall, but if we're plant planting seedlings, we may not need to have the longevity of a slash wall uh, if we can build a brush wall around some of these. So that's some of the research that we're involved with. What's next with this? Caffrey's the current player, and so we're, we're looking forward to a lot of interactions with SUNY ESF and some other partners. So I talked about the brush walls. Um, Shun Tao Chu and his graduate student, Nick Cranmer, uh, are working on refining the estimation of slash wall volume. We're going to be looking at forest carbon research, doing some terrestrial and maybe some aerial LIDAR inventory work. The, the slash walls that I mentioned that are shown here in the picture, we're going to be developing hopefully some silvicultural guidelines. Um, Professor Ackerman up at SUNY ESF has done some really cool stuff with virtual reality and forests. So we're going to see about uh, maybe developing a joint project there. We have two overstory removals. So the gas line harvest has been sold. The South Recknagel harvest has been sold. We're looking to do another slash wall in the near future in a stand that's going to require some I don't know what we call it, augmented reproductions. We're going to have to plant some seedlings because we don't have adequate stocking. And then we've just, a number of people, a number of organizations in New York have just launched into a project with NRCS and DEC where we're looking at uh, measuring, monitoring, verification, and reporting of forestry and other climate smart agricultural practices, which include slash walls and silvopasture. So I'm going to stop here with a shameless plug, pull out your calendar and mark the date, September 26th. We will be uh, holding our annual forest regeneration field tour at the Arnott Forest. Um, this is a picture from a couple of years ago in South Recknagel. So this is the oak stand and that, that canopy may not be there when we go to visit it this September. So with that, I'm going to leave that up. I can see uh, see the see the questions. You all were very busy. I, the, the screen kept flashing on me. So I, I appreciate your interactions. And I know that some of you were uh, asking questions and others were answering those. So that's great. So let me, I'm going to scroll back towards the top and I'll just work down through. So feel free to type in questions. I'll stick around as long as I need to. The um, uh, for those of you that are interested in continuing education credits, you've you've done all that you need to do when you registered for this webinar. So let's find the first question. So David, hi David, wants to know if there's any damage from beech bark disease or beech leaf in the R nuts. We have lots of beech bark disease in the r not. We have not yet detected beech leaf disease. I understand that beech leaf disease is present in the Ithaca area. Uh, Mark wants to know why the particular replacement species were chosen. So I'm guessing you're asking about the design, what we're listing is the desired or the commercial species. Those are the species that were present because of occurring in the seed bank or the seedling bank. And, and those would be the species that we're, we're trying to manage for. We have, we've talked about, uh, William Schroeder wants about livestock fencing and solar electric fencing designs. The concern with that is that you get a branch that falls on it and you're out of commission. And that's even less rugged than some of the, some of the, um, high fences that people put in using um, high tensile wire. Um, you also have concerns about maintaining that and shorting out with the vegetation that grows up around it. So that we talked about that. We have not experimented with it. So if somebody has and they've had good luck, let us please tell us about it. Our 
our presumption was that it was going to be uh, too difficult to maintain it. So Justin says uh, seven to eight foot tall woven wire stays up six to eight years in northern hardwoods. Could some way get away with electric, but only for three to five years. That's in response to William. So William asks about difference in height needed on steeper slopes. So that's where um, trying to work with the topography and being able to be flexible in the positioning of those matters. So we've had some areas where we've been able to do that. And if you can build the slash wall so that deer approach it from the downhill side, it's a very, I mean, it's an intimidating impediment to begin with. But if you're standing three feet below it and looking up, then instead of it looking like a 10 foot obstacle, it looks like a 13 or 14 foot obstacle. Uh, in other places, and it didn't happen very often, the, the, it was built, actually the slash hole was built adjacent to and just below a road. And the deer didn't, didn't go through that initially because of the width. But what happened was we had a, essentially a snow bridge crusted over because of drifting and deer we saw tracks deer walked in fortunately the snow was crusted so they didn't eat any seedlings and then they walked out but it was just a word to the wise uh Brittany wants to know about risk of leach leakage is deer browse excluded from one area and displaced to other areas i'm going to say it has to be so right now we have on our property the cornels are not forced we have um, it's over 4,000 acres and we have, so let's say 4,200 acres. We have about 600 acres inside a slash wall. So that's one seventh of the property, uh, is protected from deer. So those deer are going somewhere and eating something. The, the relative change in impact though, I'll argue isn't significant. The deer, before we had the slash walls, the deer at the r not were absolutely completely preventing desirable forest regeneration. They're still preventing desirable forest regeneration. So um, so we haven't, we, we've displaced them, but I'm gonna, I'll make the argument that we haven't um, appreciably increased the negative impact they have. So Justin has some good pricing here on uh, fencing, small fencing that he put in in a larger area. Uh, Eli wants to know if there's any monitoring impact understory herbaceous like trillium by the disturbance generated moving all the slash. So we have not, uh, we've not gone in and monitored that. We're gonna be, uh, we have not gone in to monitor that. No, we have seen, I've seen Dutchman's britches and we've seen trillium inside the slash walls and we often don't see it outside the slash walls. So there is certainly disturbance. Um, the, the majority of the disturbance associated with building the slash wall is concentrated in that 100 feet outside. And initially, we were going to be looking to do some soil uh, compaction measurements. I couldn't figure out how to do that because it was in a very stony soil. So we, we don't have any estimate of that either. So Brittany asks, how long are they effective before they start to break down? The first, the first four that we built in 2017, we had compromised at the end of five growing seasons. Uh, because of we had by year three of those, we had calculate the slumping rate at 10%, and we increased the specifications from a 10-foot wall to a 10-foot wall at with a two-inch diameter. So the at 10 feet you should be having material that's two inches in diameter which means your total wall is going to be more like 14 12 to 14 feet high um, we're anticipating that that's going to give us longevities in the seven to nine years something like that but those remain to be tested So Colin wants some about specific tonnage needed when planting the slash wall. How do you know if you have enough material on site? That is the hundred, the million dollar question. And everybody is and should be asking that because you don't want to start this if you don't have enough material. 
So we've, I reported, uh, I guess I reported it maybe later after you asked this. So it's 30 tons per hundred feet of wall total, or for six inch material, it's 20 tons per hundred feet. The six inches is a, for us is essentially a commercial threshold. So you can sell firewood or something like that. Uh, we don't have pulp markets around here. Now the, the six inches, that doesn't mean that all of those stems would necessarily be merchantable. There's a lot of material that's in there that's rotten or too crooked to put through a, a debarking drum, like for a pulp, pulp pre-processing pulp. Um, but just those were the measurements that we came up with. The LIDAR work is going to refine that, um, but I'm not, it's, it'd be inappropriate for me to share those numbers. We'll be, uh, I'll, I'll send an email when we were able to do that to everybody that's, that signed up for this webinar. Jacqueline wants to know about invasive shrubs and they take over the areas that we've worked thus far had very little invasive shrub. The area that I've talked about where we're going to have to do some augmented uh, seedling establishments some planting that's got pretty good cover of bush honeysuckle and multiflora rose and autumn olive. So we're going to have to, we're going to figure out what we need to do in that case to deal with that. It'll probably involve some early season herbicide, broadcast herbicide treatment. So in late April and early May, and it varies from year to year, the invasive shrubs break leaf before the native species do. And so we can do effectively a selective broadcast foliar herbicide treatment with very limited, limited collateral damage. Hayden wants to know if I can talk about how the cost was calculated to factor in income loss from the use of forest products to build the slash walls. Contractor time, productive acre loss to a wide, great, great question. So I'll, let me work through those. So it was calculated based on machine and operator time. And I don't remember what that was per hour, but we calculated how long it took them to build a length of fence. And it averaged between initially the first average was two feet per minute, and then it was 2.2 feet per minute. Obviously, that's going to depend upon the machine, but that was that was based over maybe 10,000 feet of of estimating. So we have a lot of variability built in that topography factors into that hugely on on steep terrain um it was double the time than it was on flat terrain and we just simply and i'm not going to try and do the count do the give you the formula in my head but we say okay we know that it's you know a few hundred dollars per operator hour with a tracked feller buncher hot saw and we can build um two feet per minute so you do the conversions and you come up with dollars per foot. And that's how we got to the dollar. Uh, we The specific number was $1.47. We just reported as $1.50 per foot to build it. The volume of 20 tons per 100 feet works out to be about 75 cents per foot. So the so that's, that's a landowner cost as opposed to a logger cost. So the logger absolutely needs to be compensated for what they're building, whatever the cost is. So those, those numbers need to be inflated. The landowner can, those are the landowner's trees. The landowner can decide if they want to allocate those trees to excluding deer so that they can regenerate desirable species or if they don't want to do that. So we have not, we usually report it and I apologize, I didn't today, but that, that would be a $1.50 for the construction and then an estimate of 75 cents per foot. Uh, so $2 and 25 cents total cost pre-inflation for building the slash walls. The numbers, um, so the productive acreage lost works out to be, it depends a lot on the area. So the bigger it is, the percentage of the harvest that's lost to the footprint of the slash wall goes way down but it's something on the order of seven to 10%. Um, now, eventually those will regrow forests, but not in the immediate term. So Bruce, hi Bruce, we uh, did we use topographic features 
we did. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. Um, okay, Gordon, trying to get red oak regen under scattered veneer stems in a hardwood harvest like this. We use slash carpet by the processor and a circle around the residual stems. Neat. Hoping for microsites where acorns will escape deer, turkey, squirrels, and uh, turkeys' opinions. So where I've seen kind of the layering of slash, that if you have established seedlings, that works. It can work. Um, where, you, where you don't yet have established seedlings, our observation is that, and we saw that here with slash walls, so there's a lot of material it's high off the ground, big, large material, slumps at a rate of 10 inches per year. So if you say, all right, we're losing 10 inches a year. So if you start with what you've described, let's say you've got three feet of this, then you've got three and a half years before that's going to slump you're, and based on our calculations. And the question is, are you going to get a seedling to produce the seed, to germinate, to grow and get to five feet of height? within that three years. My observation is that that doesn't happen very often. Uh, Jillian says access to the interior. Um, we, we have, we, we um, well now what we do is we build the walls completely and then we pick a convenient location and cut a passageway um, that's wide enough for whatever we need to get in there. So if we need to get, if it's a big harvest and we need to be able to get in with ATVs to do something, then we'll cut a bigger opening. Otherwise we usually cut a four foot wide opening and then we put in, we put in our little special, it's kind of a, kind of a um, serpentine passageway. Like, you know, when you go into a subway station or the bank and you have to go back and forth, well, we do that with just one back and forth so you go in going to the east and then cut back to the west or whatever it is. Uh, and that keeps the deer out, but it's easy enough to let hunters in. Hayden says, any consideration to leave the pinchery regeneration alone to grow? Well, that's in fact what we did because as a research site, I wasn't willing to compromise the research to do any management of pinchery because we didn't have the option to do replication of that. So that's just growing. And those were in two of the early slash walls. The deer have both compromised those slash walls. The good news is this, this new slash wall that I keep mentioning and making reference to is going to include both of those harvest sites. So we'll have a chance to build a new slash wall. The pin cherry is starting to break up a little bit or differentiate height-wise after seven or eight growing seasons and the elderberry is too, um, but they really slowed the process. We've got decent regeneration of, of red maple and sugar maple inside those stands, um, but not growing very fast. Greg wants to know if we did any pre-harvest sampling in all of the Caffrey plots we did. We did the, the picture that you see here, the South Recknagle harvest, we have uh, pre-harvest data in in all of those situations almost i mean it's their numbers are pretty easy to remember because they're very consistent we run between 900 and a thousand beech stems per acre beech saplings per acre so it'd be like one inch up to four inches in diameter thousand nine hundred to a thousand per acre and effectively zero desired species uh, less than four inches in diameter. So anything, we may have a couple scattered sugar maple or red maple saplings, but not enough to say so. And no, effectively no seedlings that are within access of deer. All right, so Justin's uh, suggesting you could also put a ladder on one side and up over the other side, kind of like an A, uh, that would work. There are other creative things. Um, uh, I guess I'm happy to cut a <laughs> cut an access portal. Um, I, I think the, there was one time I crawled over a slash wall and all I kept thinking about was dropping my cell phone 
And so uh, I'll just stay closer to the ground. Okay. So Gabrielle, the wide, the, the walls, we spec out at 20 feet width. And we don't really pay too much attention to that. By the time you build a wall that's 10 feet high to a two inch branch, the base of that is going to end up being about 20 feet wide. Carl, thank you. Artem. So, uh, yeah, there's a, in Wisconsin, they've done some work with Aspen. We actually, so those of you uh, that listen to podcasts, you should check out Silva, Silva, S-I-L-V-I, cast, Silva cast. Um, this is um, run by two Silva culturalists from the Wisconsin DNR. And Brett and I were, were uh, coupled with a forester, I think out of Wisconsin, maybe it was Minnesota. And they were using slash walls. They had started a few years after we did around Aspen. So they were building relatively smaller slash walls. But if you're trying to regrow Aspen and you're working with root suckers, you can get above the height of deer pretty quickly. So they only were looking for uh, exclusion maybe for three or four years. But I, I appreciate that link, um, and I will I'll give that a check. Oh, it looks like there. So the link says Red Oak Shelterwood. So I'll I'll look at that. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Jerry wants about treating heavy fern cover prior to harvest and wall construction. So. The areas where we've been, we've not had uh, heavy fern cover, uh, fortunately speaking. We're monitoring that. So one of the data sets that I haven't yet looked at are what we call site variables, which includes things like percent cover of fern. But we've not, we've not seen in my casual observations, and I've not heard reported that we have extensive um, fern fields developing. And I usually see those, and I don't know if I've heard foresters um, opinion that those fern fields that you see are often associated with deer presence. So if we're excluding, and that would be because of the browsing. So if we're excluding the deer, we get really good vegetative regrowth that may shade out the fern that may limit the need to manage that. Okay. Uh, Bruce wants to know how wide and tall does regenerate New York require? And I think um, Scott Moxon required reported later they're using our specifications. So 10 feet to a two inch diameter, then 20 feet wide. So Matt Ross asks about the cost. I mentioned that 75 cents of low grade. Okay, Ken Canfield says now two in Massachusetts. That's good. Okay, Jones offering uh, observation about the maintenance needed by solar fencing. And the question, invasive plants in these walls that we've done. So right now we're, we're sitting on about 10, what we call commercial harvests. So these are uh, all of them have been commercial and we've sold the material and paid for the work to be done. Um, up until the Caffrey walls, all of them were part of commercial harvests. And then we kind of backed into the research side of it. The Caffrey walls have all been straight up research. So we're sitting on the Caffrey. I think we have a dozen walls there and about a dozen pre-Caffrey. And we have about 70,000 feet of perimeter. Um, we don't have... In those areas, thankfully, we haven't had to address invasive plant problems. In this upcoming wall, we will. Oh, good. Here's the, here's the, there's a link there from Rich McLean on the second Massachusetts slash wall. Aaron wants to know about the fourth round of Regenerate New York. I'll leave that for, um, I'll leave that for Scott or, oh, there Scott says to be announced soon. 
J.P. Barsky. Thank you, J.P. Glad to see you here. J.P. was involved with uh, many of the slash walls in southern New England. He's been a, a great asset as a colleague. So we have, if John Woodcock wants to know if, where to learn about building the gates, if you go to uh, slashwall.info, you can download our best management guide, and that includes the the design that we use for building the gates. So that's slash wall dot info. Uh, Wolf Miller wants to know about the size. So it's the size. There's a, there's a size at which you're going to struggle to find enough material, but there's also a balance between the amount of material that you need and or the now the, the size so let me let me just start over again on a smaller harvest the footprint that you remove out of a deer's home range is less and that may be that may allow for a smaller a sh less tall wall and that's what we're trying to get at and one of the things we're testing when we look at these two acre and four acre walls now, interestingly, with the LIDAR work is also looking at the volume of wood in a in a seven foot wall, which was which was and that's not our recommendation. That's an experimental treatment, a seven foot wall versus a 10 foot wall. We'll be able to report on that in the in the near term, near future. So it may be you can't build like on one acre, we could not build typically build a 10 foot tall wall, but you may not need a 10 foot tall wall. That's a that's a testable hypothesis at this point it's only a hypothesis i do know there were two landowners in new york that built slash walls with their tractor their farm woods tractor uh one of them built it by hand and they built it to six feet tall now on a on a one acre or a smaller parcel i'm guessing that's probably enough but we haven't done the research to be able to verify that so where we get into acreages where it's your probably going to be able to have enough material you're looking in the five probably five acres certainly by the time you're at nine or ten acres you have enough you should have enough wood how other rob wants to know how other wildlife species interact or repeated by these walls um, they wiggle their way through great question we have the trail cameras we're using to monitor deer have 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 captured pictures of excuse me Every mammal that we know of on the Arnott Forest uh, going over or some way getting to the inside of those walls, except for deer, and there are no pictures of otters. So we have raccoons and squirrels. Turkeys aren't mammals, but I'll say turkeys. Um, uh, just the whole line. Foxes, red fox, gray fox, bobcats, fishers, uh, black bear. Um, I, I have to believe the walls are probably great denning sites, overwintering sites for black bears. So if anything, these slash walls are a mecca and an attractive nuisance for other wildlife because of the habitat that they provide. Matt Ross, uh, ticks. Yes, absolutely. We'd love to find, I mean, there's, I, and I love these, the, the tick solutions or questions come up. Um, there's a, there's a, dozen questions that we would love to be able to explore with slash walls. Keith Conan, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm uh, Keith's uh, been a lot of fun to interact with and has been tenacious in working with the Forest Service um, to, to get a slash wall built. First one on, to my knowledge, on U.S. Forest Service property. Lou Ward's posted the slash wall site. Thank you, Lou. So Russell wants to know if it makes sense to select a stash slash wall site ready for final harvest instead of a site ready to require reentry. Uh, that depends on, I'd say, what's there. So if you have if you have established advanced regeneration in adequate numbers. And you wanted to, and you were ready to do the final overstory removal and build a slash wall, that'd be great. 
and then and i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna venture that those established desired seedlings are gonna do extremely well even if you go in and brush them as um as we did so those hardwoods are going to re-sprout uh so i think it depends on what you have in place hi barbara yep it's great to have your group barbara hosted a uh, from the New York State DEC hosted um, a group from the Northeast of her counterparts who came to the Arnott last year. Uh, Justin points out another advantage to slash walls and the disturbance with bulldozer um, and the potential for invasion by invasives. So Colin wants to know building from pine or brush. So the red pine Slash wall, as you can imagine, was built almost entirely out of log length red pine, which were oriented more or less perpendicular to the perimeter of the harvest. And that was, those were set up, those, they used like 24 inch stems of the red pine. And our, our goal with that one, I forgot to mention it, was to build low and wide. So we, we, we targeted, uh, I think, a seven foot tall and 25 foot wide wall and that has up until the last year that has done a good job of excluding deer in terms of brush brush breaks down but the brush walls that i mentioned uh we've built those with a feller buncher we've built those with a bulldozer just scraping the surface those are potentially um those, those will exclude deer probably not for as long Uh, Wolf wants to know about wildlife biologists, what they've thought. So we've had Pennsylvania sent up foresters that worked from the uh, Pennsylvania game lands, game commission lands. We've had uh, uh, deer biologists from New York. We've had um, Audubon, New York, and Lab of Ornithology people. And by and large, um, everybody likes what happens inside the slash wall from an early successional habitat perspective and looking at the habitat created by the slash wall is all very positive. Um, I'm not able to comment on what NRCS might do with brush walls versus slash walls. I mean, it's, it is a brush pile. I'll, I'll argue with anybody um, till I run out of oxygen that the slash wall is a brush pile. Now, whether it satisfies NRCS criteria, I don't know that gets to a higher level of conversation. David, good point about fire um, in the Northeast. Most of you realize we typically don't have to worry about fire. Um, that said, it would be fun because it would be fun to be able to get fire in some of these areas because of the potential for fire when you're trying to manage oak. So if you've been through the oak silva, you'll know that they, the Folks in Pennsylvania, foresters in Pennsylvania rely a lot on fire to help control non-oak hardwoods from sprouting and use that to regenerate um, regenerate the oak species. So I'm not, we haven't had a chance to do that. SUNY ESF just hired a new silviculturalist that's got a background in fire. So we may be able to get some projects underway where we can try and do something, or we would love to interact with people further to the south and, and think about fire with those. It'd be good to have a some um, microsite, uh, microclimate monitoring in these slash walls. My guess is at the ground level, is, there's a lot of moisture that's being held, but the material that's towards the top is going to dry out. Aaron wants to know about black cherry regen is pin cherry, no. So in some areas, we have black cherry regeneration where we have black cherry seed sources. The r not doesn't have a lot of black cherry as a seed source. Um, we apparently do have a lot of pin cherry as a seed source. Oh, Justin has a good, good notion there. Google passage through livestock fence. All right. Tom's also talking about fire hazard. I just mentioned that. Carl mentions fire. So Gordon talks about pin cherry. It's a, it's a valid point. 
Pinch area is a desired element when it forces self-pruning of the desired crop trees, the species, uh, and then drops out uh, three or four decades into the stand. Uh, that's absolutely an accurate statement. Our concern is that the seedlings that we have intermingled with the pinch cherry, uh, when that when the when that wall slumps enough that deer compromise the wall, those seedlings are now vulnerable to deer. So we don't have the walls have a longevity. That wall had a longevity of five or six years. We need we need to be able to um, protect those seedlings until they get to be five or six feet tall. And then at that point, if they're intermixed with pin cherry, that's great. And the pin cherry can do as described there, but we don't have the, um, so we haven't figured out how to do that other than what I'm thinking. And I haven't tested, I'm just, just a thought experiment is if you go in and you thin to some standard thinning density, so good proper thinning technique um, and, and prescription that should produce enough sunlight to trigger the pin cherry seed, some of it to germinate, and then it's either going to die in the shade left behind by the thinning or the deer will browse it. And in either case, you've depleted at least some portion of that seed bank. Carl has a slash management link there to share. So lots of thank yous and thank you to all of you. Last comment there from Harmon. Harmon was um, Harmon was our first woodland owner to work with uh, Kellen Murphy and uh, Todd Martin, who was a logger out of Boonville, built a slash wall up in Shenango, uh, Madison County. Sorry, Harmon, I got to get your going to get your county wrong. Ken Kettler from Michigan. Hi, Ken. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Those are great questions. Several good links. See, I learned something new again today. And I appreciate uh, all y'all's time for questions and, and sticking around. We still have 70 of you on and uh, it's always a lot of fun. So I'll be back at seven o'clock if you want to see the same thing all over again. Y'all have a great afternoon. Appreciate it.